thank you uh, for the opportunity and thanks for being with us tonight uh, to talk about something that we're both very passionate about. Um, and this portion is going to kind of talk about bringing in those advanced hemodynamic monitors uh, and how we can use that with cerebral oximetry uh, on a single platform to get to that individualized precision medicine uh, for each individual patient. Uh, my disclosure slides uh, the same uh, as Dr. Fisher mentioned earlier. So what are our goals with, with Acumen uh, as well as cerebral oximetry? Um, one thing is, is we want to use the Acumen HPI or high potential prediction software combined with that cerebral oximetry to treat flow and perfusion, right? Our ultimate goal that we've learned from med school uh, in our residencies and in our practices, we're not just worried about pressure, right? Our ultimate goal is to get oxygen to the mitochondria and treat that flow and perfusion um, at, the mic at the microscopic level. Uh, we, have we haven't had a way to truly do that, in my, my uh, opinion, objectively, um, until I've got to use more cerebral oximetry and kind of used it in that way. And the fact that the pressure that we see in the OR is just an arterial pressure, right? It's, it, it does, we, we assume that with that pressure, if we have good oxygen and good hemoglobin, then we're, we're doing our best that we can to oxygenate that mitochondrial level. Um, but I have some examples to show that that's not always the case. Uh, and we wouldn't know unless I, or I wouldn't know unless I had the cerebral oximetry to help me. So we're going to use Acumen HPI parameter also um, to even reduce the hypotension. Uh, as, we, as Dr. Fisher mentioned, uh, the hypotension itself uh, can be bad. The comorbidities that come along with that are extreme, especially, especially in our population of cardiac surgery. And it does, really doesn't take a ton of hypotension to get those comorbidities. Um, I always teach uh, to my residents that we shouldn't wake a patient up at the end of the day uh, and say, well, the patient woke up, we did our job, we did everything we can for that patient and give ourselves a pat on the back. And maybe for cardiac surgery, we, we look post-op day one, or if we're gonna ear rest or fast track the patient, you know, we look that afternoon. But I think we need to think about the long-term uh, effects of these patients and the, the potential that they may have AKI, even if they have hypotension for as little as five minutes. So use this Acumen HPI parameter to pre prevent that and then not only prevent hypotension, but actually treat the right cause and the etiology of the hypotension. As you can see in an example later, and we all know we've seen examples in the OR when you walk in and someone has just treated the pressure with something to artificially increase the pressure without, with in a compromising flow, perfusion, and uh, doing it with just a, um, a, a habit. This is what I always use. I always use phenylephrine. Uh, pressure is just fine, doc. You, you, know, you know how it is. Um, so I think we need to get at the root cause. I think we need to get objective data to treat that root cause. And this is what I've used uh, this software for. So what is Acumen HPI software? Well, it's comprised of, of three components here, and it's all on the, the hemisphere platform as I'll refer to it uh, with Edwards Life Sciences. And that same platform uh, supports cerebral oximetry. So you can put it all together on one screen. So we have an HPI number, which is an index value from zero to 100 with the higher the likelihood of a hypotensive event occurring, the higher the number, and also the closer to the event that that may occur. Now in this algorithm, a hypotensive event is defined as a math less than 65 for a duration greater than one minute. You can also get an HPI high pop-up alert to show you that yes, uh, you're likely to become hypotensive when the number reaches greater than 85 for two consecutive readings. Now this is very real time as well. So each reading uh, is only uh, occurs in 20 second intervals. Um, so as Dr. Fisher mentioned, these parameters give you real-time information and feedback to be able to treat this individual patient that we have in the OR uh, or in the ICU. We get the secondary screen uh, that gives us a lot of that information to, to get at why is the patient truly hypotensive or, or are we truly compromising flow, uh, which is a very important information. So if we zoom in on that, we get things uh, that we're all familiar with, with preload, contractility, and afterload. Uh, preload stroke volume variation, uh, so the percent difference between maximum and stroke volume during respiratory cycle. I think a lot of us are familiar with this parameter. Contractility, so using DPDT, uh, and this is using an arterial pressure waveform. Uh, and I should mention all this, the Acumen HPI is an arterial pressure uh, device. It's a transducer that connects to the hemisphere platform um, to provide all this information. 
So that's why we say there's a portion that's minimally invasive uh, to monitor these patients as well. Uh, this can all be monitored with the cerebral oximetry stickers uh, wherever we need to place them, uh, whether it's forehead or you know somatic oximetry for a certain indication, uh, along with an arterial line, uh, which in cardiac surgery is pretty minimally invasive. There's also a newer parameter on, on here called EADYNE or dynamic arterial elastance. And what it does is it's going to actually predict the pressure response to an increase in volume in a pre pre preload dependent patient. So I'll show a little bit later, but it kind of shows us where this patient is on the um, elastance curve to know if fluid is actually going to treat the pressure or if we need another alternative to treat pressure. And then we have our HPI number here, which uses uh, 23 predictive features to alert us to hypotension. So again, an HPI number is not a number that you're going to uh, react to and treat necessarily. The goal is to alert you that you're likely becoming hypotensive. And I kind of describe this to the residents as, this is a cardiovascular instability number, right? We're starting to become more unstable. Our MAP may be adequate for that patient, maybe 70. But if our HPI number jumps from 20 to 40 to 60, we know something's changing in that patient's cardiovascular stability. And then we can look at our secondary parameters and see what's trending down or what we can do to fix that before we even become hypotensive. So the lower the number, the less likely you're gonna be hypotensive uh, or the longer the time period before that event will occur. Now, of course, this is dynamic, so it's changing constantly. Um, and this is a number that, that as, as physicians and clinicians, uh, we interpret the data and put it in the clinical setting to be able to treat the patient that's in front of us. So how did they get there? Uh, they used waveform features and extracted all these waveform features from the arterial line waveform to develop this algorithm. They did it more than just a single <clears throat> feature or a single uh, feature such as afterload. They, they used combinatorial factors and changed the variability and the complex, complexity to develop these dynamic associations. So what they did is they found that there were 2.6 million features that were derived from the arterial pressure waveform. Uh, so there may be anesthesiologists out there uh, that can tell when a patient's getting sick based off the arterial line waveform. Uh, you know, when you see that sinusoidal pattern, the upstroke isn't as, as uh, steep. All those things are great, but can you do it every 20 seconds uh, using 23 complex features? Um, and that's where this technology uh, plays out and, and helps to do all this machine learning and provides that information to the clinician for the clinician to interpret. So they took these 2.6 million features, uh, they ran some machine learning algorithms and got down to the actual 23 features that help predict hypotension or a hypotensive event. Now, does it work? Well, this is the validation uh, paper, the white paper that was on it. And as you can see, uh, if we look here at the chart on the right, the first column we have is our HPI range. So this is our index value. If we get to higher numbers like the 85 and above, you can see that if once you reach 85 to 89, you have an event rate of 93% uh, the time it's gonna occur. Now, is that helpful? Well, if you look at that also, it shows that you have four minutes to respond to that, to that patient before they actually become hypotensive most of the time as a, as a median time period. So not only does it tell you that you're likely to become hypotensive, but it gives you enough time to respond to that patient and treat them, excuse me, with the with the correct uh, pharmacological or volume treatment or surgical position, whatever it may be, um, it gives you that information to, to interpret clinically, put it in the overall picture to treat that patient. So one of the things uh, that's on here is systolic slope and it's a DPDT. And what this is measuring is the maximum upslope of the arterial pressure waveform um, on that peripheral ar artery. It's measured, uh, it has absolute values uh, and numbers, but there's no actual normal population number. So this isn't a number uh, that we think of like blood pressure where you say, for the most part, less than 65, let's say. Uh, we don't want patients below that. For DBDT, there's no population normal number. So what this is, is when, when patients get in the OR, uh, you can see kind of where the range is and you put that in the clinical picture. Is this where you want them to be? Do you need them to be higher? Is that due because is that because they're on the low part of the Frank Starling, Starling curve? Do they need an anotrope? Um, and so you put all that together, and you can easily trend this and monitor this uh, this number throughout 
uh, a case. And of course, it's very, very dynamic in the cardiac surgery setting. Uh, now, there is times we need to use caution when using this number, uh, such as a low SVR in our extremely vasoplegic uh, patients post-pump, or in high cardiac outputs, which they define as an output uh, around greater than 10 or so. Um, it may not be as accurate. So this wouldn't be a, a talk about cardiac surgery unless we had at least one echo picture up here. Um, and so what this is, is this is measuring the isovolemic contraction or the DPDT during isovolemic contraction on echo. Uh, the things that I, I say about this is this is using a mitral regurgitant jet, and it's very dynamic in the OR. As you can see in this three beats here, measuring it, uh, it within these three consecutive beats, we get different numbers um, that are, are pretty big differences uh, between the patient. Um, it's also very labor intensive to, to do this. And there's a lot of uh, variability as well, because it really doesn't take much change in position of our measurements to have a significant outcome on the numbers. Now, this is the same type of thing that it was used to correlate. And uh, in, when they used this, the DPDT uh, and validated it, this is what they used to validate it. So it does correlate with LV DPDT but you're gonna get a different absolute number. So EA Dyne, uh, as we talked about where we're at on the elastance curve. So what this number tells us is if we have a patient that's hypotensive or near hypotensive, and that patient is volume responsive, and we can judge that by a SVV greater than 13 or, or PPV, uh, sometimes in our patients, though we can't satisfy those requirements to, to use those parameters. So we have to use delta stroke volume. So let's say if the delta stroke volume is greater than 10%, that patient is volume responsive. So in a volume responsive patient, the question is, is if I give that patient volume, will their pressure actually increase? Uh, we know sometimes even though they're volume responsive, their pressure not, may not increase. And that's where EA Dyne tells us. So if the EA Dyne is less than one or 0.8, even though the patient is volume responsive, their pressure won't respond to that volume. So they may need a vasopressor on top of that. If the EA dyne is greater than one or 1.2 and the patient is volume responsive, this number suggests that when you give that patient volume, their pressure will increase. So again, the root thing that we wanna get at is, you know, are we worried about pressure, flow? And my whole point is we wanna bring this all together. And I think people are starting to realize and understand this, that. We, we've known about this, we've talked about this, we've lectured about this, but do we have objective data, real-time data in the OR to help us understand this on the individual level and, and treat these patients properly? So uh, this animation here is uh, an animation of, let me see if I can optimize it to make sure that no, we're good, um, that you guys can see it. But uh, this animation is microcirculation of the gut. So on the left side here, you see our baseline, baseline microcirculation. And in this microcirculation, healthy flow is actually non-pulsatile. And you can see that all the villi are receiving uh, blood flow in this, in this situation. Now, what you see on the right is the blanching that we could see in our microcirculation or in our gut. So this patient had a volume uh, or one liter blood loss or hemorrhage, and it was corrected. So these two patients or these two uh, situation scenarios, this is actually uh, in poor sign, but these two situations had the same or similar blood pressure. So again, if you walk into the OR and you look at your macro hemodynamics and the pressure is fine, sometimes people think, well, we're doing our job, we're doing great. Patient's on a little vasopressor, but we're not harming the patient because the pressure is fine. And my challenge is, is I think we want to go one step, two steps further into that patient and actually help understand that that we're, we may be stealing you know, from microcirculation to correct our hemo, macro hemodynamics. And so we need to make sure that we treat that patient with the proper treatment um, to help benefit that patient overall and not just worry about pressure. So this is a, an extreme example uh, that I have uh, that, that kind of brings it all together with cerebral oximetry. Now we've talked about low blood pressure and we know that's bad. And uh, we have plenty of examples of that. This is a, a extreme example of, of one of my partners that we used uh, uh, the data from and uh, recreate the simulation here to show what was really going on in the case. Now this is an off pump cabbage, EF is around 25, 30%. Uh, and this is during heart manipulation. So 
uh, we know during these cases, we have to support the blood pressure, right? You know, can you help us through this? We're going to put the heart on the apex and most abnormal unphysiological position, but is the patient going to tolerate it? Well, in this situation, uh, we are correcting it with vasopressors, which is a common occurrence uh, in the practices I've been in with, with off-pump cabbages. But now that we have all the parameters, it kind of showed me a little bit more of what we were doing to some of these patients. So as you can see on this hemisphere, uh, we put MAP up here, a continuous SVR, because we have our cardiac index and uh, cardiac output here, as well as our CVP that runs to the hemisphere monitor to give us all these numbers. And we have our cerebral oximetry here. So you probably could see here, our cerebral oximetry, we put our reference value, which was our baseline, essentially around 70. And so now we're down to 64, which is 9% decrease on the right and around a 6% decrease on the left. So as you can imagine, the surgeon's looking up, looking at the, the, uh, our monitor, and all they see is a blood pressure, and they're, they're seeing a map as 98, 99, uh, which is a high. I, I do understand that. Um, but they're thinking the patient's tolerating just fine. I'm going to go ahead and continue my anastomosis. We don't need to change position. We don't need to change any, anything because the patient's tolerating this. Well, if we actually get down at the individual level, we're going to look to see that our cerebral oximetry is actually decreasing, right? We're compromising our flow at the expense of pressure. So we make the pressure fine, but our flow is now compromised. And we use three, and I use cerebral oximetry to show the objective data to tell the surgeons now, listen, I know our pressure is fine, but we're really compromising flow. So we may need to take a break, allow that heart to rest, allow the brain to rest and increase that perfusion again. And we can kind of fast forward a little bit and this shows um, kind of the extreme examples. If we go to the next slide, it kind of tells us how the patient looked overall when we looked back. So this is the same patient, gives us that same information. We see a high map. Uh, we see our cerebral oximetry over here, the STO2 on the right and the left, and that how that compromised our flow. Uh, and this was ver validated and verified by, this was early on in our evaluation. So we had a mixed venous in there as well. And we saw the same thing happen to our mixed venus. Uh, there was a recent paper that came out of uh, the group out of Wake Forest that kind of just um, had the same thoughts essentially that were, that, I, that I'm trying to carry forward as well. And I've, I've worked with um, some of the researchers there and I couldn't agree more. And it's basically saying, they basically in this conclusion said that, you know, I think that before reflexively saying we need a vasoconstrictor and a vasodilated patient, maybe we should consider other possibilities. And I think this, you know, means things like depth of anesthesia, volume status, and contractility of the heart. Well, we're kind of the experts in that when it comes to cardiac anesthesia and these cardiac surgery patients. But again, I think it helps us to have that objective data to be able to treat the root cause to help increase our, our perfusion um, measured by cerebral oximetry in these situations. This is another example to just kind of show how we have echo um, and how those correlations in echo can increase our cerebral oximetry when we have all of the information. So pre-intervention here, we have a patient that's volume down. Uh, we can see on our hemisphere that's simultaneous here, our cerebral oximetries are in the 60s here. We know our index is low, our DPDT is low because we probably need more volume to put that patient in the correct position on Frank Starling. Um, and we can see post-intervention after that patient got volume. Our cerebral oximetry responds to that, right? Our cardiac index responds to that and our DPDT responds to that. And then up here, our HPI was 96, so they knew we were gonna become hypotensive. And now we're at HPI 24, so less likely to become hypotensive and our stroke volume is increased. But with all these parameters, we now I, had not, I now was able to see that not only did this fix what the heart looked like on echo, but it actually fixed, uh, you know, or increased and probably um, benefited this patient with cerebral oximetry and increased perfusion. So just to wrap it up uh, before we take some questions. Uh, so Acumen HPI software can be used to reduce hypotension and then actually treat uh, the correct etiology to prevent that end organ malperfusion, which is our ultimate goal. We can use the additional parameters to provide insight on those on what we should treat. So it's not just a pressure thing. We can now work to treating flow as well. Uh, as we want to emphasize overall, we can detect and intervene on, on patients that have regional cerebral oxy oxygen desaturations. And again, this allows for more precise medicine uh, in the OR um, to treat the individual patient. 